once neglected plot on their recently inherited estate, the Duchess of Northumberland undertook to make a special garden. Inspired by a trip to the Medici estates in Italy, the Duchess wanted to make a garden that was both beautiful and educational. The carefully tended plot features things like a tropa belladonna, datura, common laurel, monk's hood, white hellebore, blue ensign flowers, and narcissus. It's called the Anic Poison Garden, because like the sign at the front gate says, do not touch any of these plants. These plants can kill you. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. We hardly need to say that mankind has been growing food for a long time. The earliest domesticated plants and horticulture that we have evidence of thus far date to 9000 BCE in the Levantine Corridor, the area that runs from the Dead Sea to the Damascus Basin. The people there planted cranes and legumes using sticks to dig in the dirt. The first written reference to gardening dates back to Sumer in Lower Mesopotamia. King Gilgamesh mentioned that his city, Uruk, was one-third gardens, though he probably meant orchards as much as anything else. From Egypt, we have paintings and models of gardeners at work, and you can still see the remains of the temple gardens at Karnak. Or you can head over to Iran to see the layout and irrigation channels of a garden that was created 2,500 years ago. For the oldest garden we can find in Europe, head over to Greece, where gardens, both practical and ornamental, were being put in by 7000 BCE, 2000 years before the Egyptians. The creation of a new science, botany, the study of plants, meant that gardens became a place of learning. Even in the ancient world, gardens could be an aesthetic choice as well as a practical one. Evidence suggests that the idea originated in Persia with Darius the Great and his Paradise Garden, beginning a tradition of walled-in garden spaces. Lavish villa gardens in the Roman Empire spread east to China and Japan, where aristocratic gardens featured miniaturized and simulated landscapes like rock gardens and waterfalls. Natural elements symbolized power and religious thought. Zen gardens appeared and emphasized the concept of using the garden for reflection to increase one's wisdom. The most famous garden in the ancient world is undoubtedly the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. According to legend, in the 6th century BCE, King Nebuchadnezzar, a name that is never not fun to say, built the gardens for his wife Amatis to ensure that she didn't become homesick for her birthplace of Medina near the Caspian Sea. But we don't get details of the garden from Nebuchadnezzar himself, which is odd considering that he recorded his many other accomplishments in cuneiform, but there's no mention of the gardens. Several ancient Roman and Greek writers wrote about the garden, though. Some scholars argue that the gardens were actually built by an Assyrian queen or the king of Nineveh. We don't know for sure, because despite the gardens being one of the seven wonders of the world, we can't find it to study it. It's believed to have been destroyed by an earthquake in the first century CE. So why were they called the Hanging Gardens? Were the garden beds suspended? Was everything planted in hanging baskets? Bonus fact, the largest hanging basket planter in the world is on the side of the Hotel Indigo in the Paddington section of London. It measures 10 by 20 feet or 3 by 6 meters and weighs upwards of half a ton. Now the hanging gardens didn't really hang so much as they overhung or draped. In their defense, the draping garden doesn't sound nearly as appealing. Accepting the premise that some royal or another wanted to build a royally grand garden in the desert, it was going to take careful planning and serious engineering to pull that off. The structure was a ziggurat, or a stepped pyramid, with walls between 20 and 75 feet high, depending on which ancient account you're reading. So picture a walled city in the desert. Rising in the center of it, alongside the palace, is a tower of greenery. Palm trees rise from terraces dripping with vines and sparkling with flowers. If the hanging gardens existed with the dimensions and abundance of plants described, it would have required over 8,000 gallons of water a day. And archaeologists aren't sure if that would even have been possible. Irrigation was a thing, of course, 
but to get that much water to the top of a building was no mean feat. Even the earliest technology for raising large quantities of water, like the Archimedes screw, were still centuries away. Can we really be sure the Hanging Gardens even existed? One group of German archaeologists spent 20 years at the turn of the century trying to find it, and came up with bubkis. But Dr. Stephanie Daly of Oxford University has uncovered new translations of ancient texts that lean into the theory that the garden existed, but that it was built by the king of Nineveh, which would put it in modern-day Mosul. Now, amazing ancient gardens don't mean lost gardens. If you're impressed by hanging gardens, wait until you hear about floating gardens. My buddy Matt from Nooks and Crannies podcast will tell you all about it. Howdy folks, Matty here from Nooks and Crannies. I am here to talk to you about hands down my favorite ethnobotanical technological innovation of all time, the Chinampas of Central Mexico. The Chinampas are human-made floating garden islands developed initially by the middle post-classic mine, somewhere between 1150 and 1350 Common Era, around Lake Chalco and Xochimilco in the south primarily near springs along those lakes' southern shores. You see, the Aztec preceded the Mayan in civilization terms, like, kind of? <laughs> they were actually known as the Triple Alliance, and that happened in 1428 Common Era. And this was made up of Mayan ethnic peoples who formed a military diplomatic alliance. The Mayan are totally still around today, and they are a very vibrant ethnic linguistic group throughout Mexico and many parts of Central America. As is often the case, a conquering group will adopt what they deem as the most useful features of their newly subordinated peoples, such as agricultural practices and technologies. And this is what happened here with the Chinampas. The Aztec essentially scaled this technology up and made it a primary form of agriculture for wide stretches along the giant lake system of central Mexico. Tenochtitlan is in the middle-ish on an island and was actually the Aztec capital. So their capital city was an island in the middle of this giant lake system. Now there is a very helpful map on Wikipedia that shows the areas where the Chinampas were and also the numerous causeways that connected them and that was a key feature of the Aztec Empire is these causeways. The Aztec, as are the Mayan, are experts at controlling and manipulating the flow of water and honestly they put the Roman aqueducts to shame. This hydraulic manipulation was very much the, both of these civilizations competitive advantage. Now aside from Wikipedia I actually found another helpful website It's called Field Study of the World and they have a really good description of how Chinampas were constructed and I would like to read it verbatim right here. Chinampas were constructed by first creating an enclosure on the lake with wooden sticks, right? This enclosure is then filled with alternating layers of mud and decaying vegetation until a solid land above the water level is formed. In this way, an artificial island is formed and trees are then planted on the edges because the roots of the trees like further help prevent erosion along the edges. Farmers and gardeners would use canoes to work these newly formed lands and to transport the produce in a more efficient manner. Using the water causeways that the Mayan and Aztec were famous for, not only were the Aztec able to create arable lands, they were able to scale it up and to prevent soil loss through erosion with the planting of the trees along the edges and reinforcing the edges, of course, with the posts, making them permanent with very little capital expenditure. Like once you have it set up, it's just there, right? Now, each like plot or garden produced enough produce, I suppose, and wildlife, believe it or not, for hunting to fully sustain the needs of the farming families and for them to support laborers and produce surplus with very little worry about drought or other natural weather problems. And being on a lake, they were able to take advantage of microclimates and biomes to their benefits. Lakes, for this reason, have always been popular settlement spots for peoples throughout time. 
The Chinampas, believe it or not, also involve principles of both terra and permaculture. Terra culture being landforming and management principles, so like the planting of the trees and the driving of the stakes and creating literally new land. And permaculture, which is like creating an enclosed ecosystem, allowing one to reduce, if not eliminate, the need for fertilization. Plus, because the Aztec capital was on an island, so Tenochtitlan, being surrounded on all sides with water is of course great for defense, but to also be surrounded like in in the opposite way on all sides by farmlands means that it is damn near impossible to siege this city, which is why the Spanish were nearly killed off when they made repeated attempts at invasion, even with their guns, germs, and steel. So the Chinampas still exist. You can go visit them right now. Well, of course, after the quarantine. But prepare to be sort of, like, sort of disappointed. They seem to look like, like, just sort of, quote-unquote, farmer's fields on the surface. Just sort of there and not that interesting. Until you jump in a boat and see how the sides are reinforced. Or jump in a plane. Look down and realize that the miles wide swath of normal looking farmland with cattle on it are actually supposed to be water. Think about this, folks. So called quote unquote ancient peoples with Stone Age tools and technology created earth, created land, simply through observation and experimentation, trial and error over centuries, which folks is the scientific method not only are these gardens and fields like just pretty rad right they remind us that when looking towards the past we do so with a lens that has been clouded by preconceived notions of the capacities and capabilities of so-called primitive peoples which is called ethnocentrism the belief that all other cultures are inferior to our own I personally think that the Chinampas are a fantastic way to quickly dispel such notions. As we say on Nooks and Crannies, talk to y'all soon, aren't we lucky? And honestly, in times like this, peace and solidarity. Be well and stay safe, folks. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear on Your Brain on Facts. Peace. Thanks, Matt. Back to the march of time down the garden path. In medieval times, the monasteries were the main repositories of gardening knowledge and herbal lore. Though we're a bit vague on the design and content of monastic gardens, they were probably a walled courtyard built around a well where the monks could grow medicinal herbs and flowers as well as sit in quiet contemplation. The earliest account of gardening in English, The Feet of Gardening, dates to about 1400 and it mentions the use of more than a hundred plants, complete with instructions for planting herbs and grafting trees and things. Despite the book being over 600 years old, there are a lot of names in it you'd recognize. Parsley, fennel, thyme, turnips, spinach, leeks, lettuce, and garlic. Early gardening was largely practical, but the Renaissance, with its increased prosperity, brought an upsurge of curiosity about the natural world and the money needed to harness it to one's whim. The French especially were all about that carry-on. The great gardens of Europe derived from the influence of the French designer André Le Nôtre, creator of the gardens at Versailles. The French style represented extreme formality, clean lines, intricate designs, and a layout that would frame the house. The widespread adoption of the style among European nobility and gentry reflects the potent influence of French culture at the time. The gardens of the Palace of Versailles that the English were emulating are a precise, pristine, torturously manicured affair that took 40 years to complete and cover 800 acres, twice the size of the Principality of Monaco. Now, the Industrial Revolution changed the world in a lot of ways the least of them bringing half of the world's population into cities where people couldn't grow their own food. Large cities like London, Paris, and New York, and later the major cities of India and China, became dirty and polluted because of the industry, inadequate housing, and lack of healthy open space. Gardening as an institution shrunk, 
so farming, aided by new machines and technology, got bigger. At the turn of the 1900s, food production was at an all-time low in both the United States and Europe. Food prices in America soared. People were encouraged to go meatless and wheatless to ameliorate the shortages. A few weeks before the U.S. entered World War I, the National War Garden Commission was formed to encourage people to grow their own food, so the crops of the large farms could go to the soldiers. Enter the Victory Garden. Propaganda posters encouraged civilians to sow the seeds of victory by planting their own vegetables, and local organizations like women's clubs and chambers of commerce helped to spread the word. Newly minted gardeners were provided with instruction pamphlets on what to plant in their area, when and how. People latched right onto the idea. Knowing people would have food that they would then need to preserve, the government began distributing booklets on canning and drying. Even children were encouraged to garden. The Federal Bureau of Education initiated the U.S. School Garden Army program, encouraging the children to be soldiers of the soil. In 1917 alone, more than 3 million new gardens were planted, rising to more than 5 million in 1918, which generated an estimated 1.5 million quarts of canned fruits and vegetables. And that's just in the U.S. Over in Britain, they had the allotments, land assigned to citizens to garden on, many of which families still maintain a century later. You can hear more about them in episode 104, Making Do. Victory Gardens became important again a generation later when we, as a species, had a war after the war to end all wars. Eleanor Roosevelt even planted a Victory Garden on the White House lawn. This time, rationing became a major part of people's dinner tables, but if you grew something yourself, you could eat as much of it as you wanted. Throughout both wars, the Victory Garden campaign served as a successful means of expressing patriotism safeguarding against shortages on the home front, and easing the burden on farmers working to feed the troops and civilians overseas. It was also a major boost of morale and camaraderie. We were all in it together. And I think that feeling is part of why so many people are gardening right now. If you've got a garden going, whether you've been doing it for 20 years or it's your first time trying, even if it's just a window box in your apartment, Post a picture of it on social media and tag the show, Facebook and Instagram, your brain on facts and Twitter at brain on facts pod. And people who have been posting pictures of themselves with their copy of the your brain on facts book. I love each and every one of them. Please keep it up. And if you have a minute to spare, we could do with a couple of reviews over on Amazon or Goodreads. It is the basis for most people's purchasing decisions these days. And be sure to tell me what your favorite fact was when you're done reading the book. And don't think I've forgotten about my fabulous supporters at patreon.com slash yourbrainonfacts. In this past month, we have been joined by Paul, Vladislav, and Charles, and also seen Eden and Jennifer increase their pledges, all of which are hugely appreciated. And remember that for the duration of the COVID crisis, all membership levels are receiving all rewards. From kids' books to that Super Bowl ad a few years back, if you ask someone to picture a farmer, it's the same archetype every time. Middle-aged man, plaid shirt, slightly leathery skin. If you ask them to picture a gardener, it'll be a matronly woman with a warm, satisfied smile. Both these archetypes will undoubtedly be white. And this isn't a narrow margin of demographic disparity. 98% of rural land is owned by white farmers. Black farmers are 1.4% of the U.S. farmer population, but 100 years ago, it was more than 10 times that. Ownership of land by black farmers has dropped from over 41 million acres to just over four. And this depletion didn't just happen out of the blue. The Atlantic slave trade stole not only the lives and labor of people, but also their agricultural knowledge. South Carolina became a thing thanks to their rice plantations, whose muddy fields couldn't be worked by machines, thanks to the expertise of the people trafficked there from the Senegambia region of West Africa. They also applied their knowledgeable hands to okra, millet, cowpeas, and sorghum, many of which they brought with them. 
Have you ever wondered how the enslaved people brought seeds from Africa under those circumstances? It's not like they had an opportunity to pack. Well, in a way they did. Some women, knowing that their families could be taken soon, would braid seeds into their hair to ensure they'd have them with them to support their families and keep their traditions alive. Even after the post-emancipation promise of 40 acres and a mule crumbled under the weight of President Andrew Johnson's stunningly blatant racism, black farmers were relegated to sharecropping, a system that made the white landowner richer while driving the black tenants farther into inescapable debt. A lot like the payday lending system we have now, except with food. It would take until the early 1900s for black farmers to be able to buy land of their own, usually in small parcels, a few acres at a time. These limitations didn't limit the intellectual curiosity of the farmers, who pioneered methods that are still in use today. Remember hearing about George Washington Carver in elementary school, the man who figured out a hundred different things to do with peanuts, none of which were grind them up and pair them with jelly? He sought ways to use peanuts to make them a more financially worthwhile crop, so he could convince gardeners and farmers to plant peanuts as part of crop rotation. Peanuts and other legumes put nitrogen back into the soil after it's been taken out by monocrops like corn, cotton, and tobacco, thus improving the soil. Carver also developed a system for spreading his research directly to the community through workshops and demonstrations, a system that would later become the U.S. Department of Agriculture Extension Program. You ever read a gardening book or Google a gardening question and it tells you to call your local extension agent? That all started with George Washington Carver. Black farm ownership peaked in the 1920s. Unfortunately, that coincides with the rise of the second incarnation of the Ku Klux Klan. They couldn't have black families able to support themselves. That just wouldn't do. They drove black people off their land through terror or stole it through legal chicanery. During the 20th century, the price of open land rose dramatically, moving self-sufficiency farther away, and that trend hasn't changed. Forced into cities, black people in America were denied the opportunity to grow their own food that even suburbanites enjoy. But there is a drive to reclaim some sort of agrarian equality. Leah Penniman, author of Farming While Black, is co-director of Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York. Their mission focuses on training the next generation of black and brown farmers, as well as providing food and medicine for our community. The farm is part of a coalition of groups claiming sovereignty and calling for reparations of land and resources so that we can grow nourishing food and distribute it in our communities. Soul Fire Farm also leads the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, which calls on good-hearted, good-minded people to donate land, which can then be farmed by people of color. And so far, several hundred acres have been put into trusts to be donated. Here in my hometown of Richmond, Virginia, an organization called Happily Natural is on a mission to help people in food-insecure urban areas with garden boxes, soil, tools, and training to grow their own food. They kicked this effort into overdrive during the COVID lockdown, when it became even more difficult for people in food deserts to get groceries. And you can donate to their Resiliency Gardening Initiative at thenaturalfestival.com. Speaking of people doing remarkable things with gardens, there are gardens out there in the world today that are must-haves for any travel itinerary, like the Garden of Cosmic Speculation in England which looks like it was designed by M.C. Escher with help from Salvador Dali and a consult with Dr. Seuss. Though sadly, the Garden of Cosmic Speculation is only open to the public one day a year. Perhaps head over to Cornwall to visit the Lost Garden of Heligan. The Lost Garden of Heligan has a storied history of prosperity, and then neglect, and then rejuvenation. The once glorious Heligan estate fell into disrepair as World War I crept across England and priorities naturally shifted. Nature began to reclaim the land in the decades that followed, swallowing up the garden and obscuring the walkways. It wasn't until 1990 that two descendants of the owning family discovered a small garden and decided to revamp the site. What makes the lost garden of Heligan so special? Ask the Mud Maid or the Giant's Head. 
enormous sculptures with plants growing on them like huge whimsical chia pets. The Heligan Garden also boasts an Italian garden, a jungle section, and an alpine ravine. Maybe check out the greenhouses of Almeria in Spain. These gardens aren't about leisure, they are money-making machines. The roughly 50,000 square acres of greenhouses on the southeast coast of Spain grow fruits and vegetables by the ton year-round, fueling the province's economy. The greenhouses are packed so tightly together, they're visible from space, thanks in part to their unique white roofs. And in fact, this sea of white-roofed greenhouses has actually lowered the local temperature by an average of 0.3 degrees Celsius every 10 years. The potential cooling effect from the reflective nature of the roofs has led some experts to suggest that similar designs could be used in geoengineering projects to bring down the temperature in other areas. For something farther afield, you could visit the Steppe Garden at Akros, Fukuoka, Japan. Fukuoka was already a pretty well-built-up city before designers had to create another building to squeeze out green space. So the ecocentric architecture firm Emilio Ambaz & Associates created a unique 5,400 square meter green area that flows into what remains of the park nearby by snaking this 14-story ziggurat-like garden up the side of the Civic Center. Akros Fukuoka's walls are mostly glass, allowing natural light into the building year-round. But the step garden is no aftermarket add-on. In 1995, when the building opened, the step garden had 37,000 plants across 76 varieties, and today there are more than 50,000 plants in 120 varieties. And just because the garden runs up the side of a massive building doesn't mean that it's off-limits. Two entrances from the park allow residents and visitors to meander up the steps that cut through the greenery. And if that's not interesting enough for you, you could always travel farther. A lot farther. Like geosynchronous orbit. Yep, they garden on the International Space Station. More or less. Mankind has been sending plants and seeds into space since we first broke the surly bonds of Earth. The first organisms in space were specially developed strains of seeds, end quote, launched on a US V-2 rocket in July of 1946, though they weren't able to recover them afterwards. The first seeds launched and recovered were corn, or maize seeds, launched later that same year, followed by rye and cotton. The seeds were being sent up by Harvard University and the Naval Research Laboratory to see how cosmic radiation exposure would affect them. In 1971, 500 tree seeds were flown around the moon on Apollo 14, brought back, planted, and the seedlings distributed through the country, as well as being sent to Brazil, Italy, and Switzerland. And then most of them were promptly forgotten about. In 1982, the crew of the Soviet Salyut 7 space station grew some rock cress, a plant related to mustard and cabbage, which became the first plants to flower and produce seeds in space. A Skylab crew experimented on the effects of gravity and light on rice plants, before they got more data than they ever wanted on the effects of gravity on a space station. In 1997, the SVET 2 space greenhouse successfully achieved a full life cycle of plant growth aboard space station Mir. Every year or so, a new system is developed to help grow food in space in the unique challenges of weightlessness, lack of natural light, and a lack of soil, which is far too heavy to take into space. The vegetable production system, just called Veggie, was tested with lettuce, Swiss chard, radishes, Chinese cabbage, and peas on the ground before being sent to the ISS. Red romaine lettuce was grown in space in Expedition 40, which is not bad considering the difficulty I've been having with it this year here on Earth. During Expedition 44, the first American astronauts to eat plants grown in space chowed down on some red romaine in 2015. Imagine how great a fresh salad must taste after weeks of pre-packaged, particularly processed foods. Since 2003, Russian cosmonauts have been eating about half of what they grow, reserving the other half for research. 
In 2012, a sunflower bloomed aboard the ISS under the care of NASA astronaut Donald Pettit. How did it know which way to look? In 2017, the Advanced Plant Habitat was designed for the ISS, which was a nearly self-sustaining plant growth system to work alongside the veggie system but require much less upkeep by the humans. Some plants that were tested in the APH included dwarf wheat and the rock cress again. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. After visiting the infamous Medici Poison Garden and the archaeological site of a Scottish monastic hospital, the Duchess of Northumberland became enthralled with the idea of creating a tourist attraction out of plants that kill. According to the Duchess, children don't care that aspirin comes from the bark of a tree. What's really interesting is to know how a plant kills you and how the patient dies and what you feel like before you die. Many visitors are surprised to see plants in the poison garden that they have around their own homes, like laurel hedges, which can produce cyanide vapor when cut. Though you might not have heard of the poison garden, you may have seen Annick Castle. It stood in for Hogwarts in two of the Harry Potter movies. Remember, you can always find the sources and the script for each episode at yourbrainonfacts.com. Thanks for spending part of your day with me, and stay safe.